Great. <sighs> Good. <laughs> Hi there. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to another Cast Iron Wednesday. That's not my uh, saying, as you know. <clears throat> A lot of these these uh, smaller YouTube cooking uh, channels have uh, this ongoing running joke or tradition, which they call Cast Iron Wednesday, which is basically they per they uh, perform they prepare something in cast iron on a Wednesday. <laughs> and upload it to YouTube either tonight or tomorrow. Strangely, it seems to be mostly the smaller channels doing Cast Iron Wednesday. The larger channels don't do too much of that. Maybe because there aren't too many larger channels that are really devoted to cast iron cooking, like this one. <laughs> so, um, yes, the uh, topic for tonight is uh, tools for a cast iron kitchen, which really means, uh, essentially, uh, it's it's kind of like uh, Kitchen Prep 101 in that a lot of this is uh, probably stuff you know already, but not everybody does. I mean, uh, some folks, of course, have been cooking their entire lives. I am one of the many these days who have not. Um, <clears throat> as I've said a number of times before, I caught the cooking bug about 10 years ago. In fact, um, in fact I can even uh, name the day when I uh, caught it, and that was December 14th, 2010. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll be telling that story some other time, probably on to, uh, December 14th of this year. But uh, it was at that time that I was only just taking my first steps into cooking, and it was at that time that I uh, first started cooking with this. And this, of course, is what I call my redneck pan. Uh, if there's any pan really, um, well, actually, let me say as well, I know that a lot of people uh, come into uh, channels like this one with questions about how can I get started with uh, cast iron cooking or what is the best pan to buy or even uh, what pan should I get as a present for my daughter or wife or the like. And uh, you really cannot go uh, much worse than to, uh, much better, I should say than to do a good old lodge cast iron skillet. These things are, as you know, they're cheap and they're available everywhere. You can get this at Walmart for uh, $15. You can get this at TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Home Goods for a little less, maybe anywhere like $12 to, four, 12 to $13. So, And of course, if you go out looking through yard sales or flea markets or the like, you're almost guaranteed to find at least one of these with prices ranging from uh, 40 to $50, yeah, for a bed for this, for a 10-inch lodge cast iron skillet, all the way down to free. <laughs> um, you really cannot do better than this. Um, and if you're going to get started out with cooking, I guess there's really uh, no better pan to get because it's durable and it'll certainly last you the rest of my, your life. It let, it's lasted me all this time. I really learned to cook in this. I learned to cook in cast iron with this, and I'm very proud that this uh, that I still use this, and this is my redneck pan. But, of course, we're not just here to talk about that one pan. I mean, again, the whole thing has to do with setting up uh, the other tools used for uh, taking care of cast iron. And uh, so right now, let me say hi to uh, Brent Griffin. Hello from Minnesota. Jamie Hurley, love your channel. Thank you. Um, Flatlands of Northern Indiana from our friend Boiler Honky Dude. A couple of regulars, and I'm very flattered for that. Um, <clears throat> also, yeah, because especially because this is a live chat, I mean, please feel free to comment and post questions. Uh, I am much better answering questions that are thrown at me than really trying to go through some kind of a prepared script. Um, as I mentioned, I started out, you know, while uh, cooking with a uh, large cast iron skillet, and I guess from there the question is, okay, got myself a cast iron skillet. What do I get next? Um, well, for that, I would say probably the best answer would be a Dutch oven. And here's where the uh, controversy starts already. Uh, in that if you're getting a uh, Dutch oven, should you go with a uh, bare cast iron, an enamel cast iron, or maybe even something that isn't cast iron? And Well, all of those answers are right, only because 
The Dutch oven is one of those things you really absolutely have to have in your kitchen. And, and uh, believe me, a uh, really durable oven safe Dutch oven is wonderful for cooking. So even though they sell those cheap things at the dollar stores, a Dutch oven is not one of them that you should get. I guess that's actually not a bad subject to mention as well. You know, what should we get at the dollar store and what should we not? Because like a lot of people, I go to the dollar store almost every day. And quite frankly, a lot of the stuff I have in my kitchen does come from the dollar store. A lot of these I was uh, very flattered to have been given as gifts. And some I actually managed to score at flea markets, yard sales, and so on and so forth. And a couple of them I did go out of my way to get. So I think I'll, I think I'll start there, in fact. Uh, what um, I mean, everybody, of course, has a utensil crock full of junk. In my case, this utensil crock happens to be uh, a uh, an 18th century gate marked uh, <laughs> cast iron uh, stovetop kettle here. I had I found this several years ago, restored it, and I've actually tried selling it a couple of times. And I even took it to uh, a flea market to uh, try to uh, sell it with a whole bunch of my other. Um, extra cast iron pieces. Yeah, my collection's big enough that I actually have an extra throwaway pile. And this one of the uh, Brimfield vendors swooped right down that morning and bought up almost my entire stock. He left a couple of things behind which he did not think would sell, including a large Dutch oven and this. So ever since then, I've kept this and I use it as a utensil crock. I myself happen to have enough cast iron that yes i can cook with this but i've got a lot of great cooking pots as well um but anyway getting down to that let me see i i mentioned utensils i think from utensils i will then go on to the basics of uh by maintaining your cast iron although i did a video on that a couple of weeks ago on washing cast iron and that's why i'm not getting into that right now um <clears throat> besides um the rule of thumb anyway is, especially if you're getting started out with setting up a really decent kitchen for the first time, probably on a low budget, we're all on a low budget, the, th uh, the things you really, really need would be a uh, good chef knife, a, uh, a stock pot for boiling water, and of course, a cast iron skillet. And we've already gotten into the cast iron skillet. So let's get into another thing, which of course would be knives. <laughs> and uh, this is what I get really for living on my own for 10 years, having a hobby and having nobody to tell me, no, you can't do that. So um, I, again, managed to uh, do a couple of good scores, including this one that came from Brimfield. This is a 10-inch uh, chef knife, and it's made by none other than K-Bar of all, of all things. Uh, yeah, the same people who make those K-Bar knives, those famous ones. My understanding is they were actually bought up by Cutco. Yeah, that company. So uh, K-Bar is actually part of them. However, either way, when I scored this at uh, Brimfield, um, it cost me 20 bucks, and it was certainly worth every uh, penny of it. I was fortunate enough in that a uh, friend online offered to uh, polish this up for me, and it was really, really beautiful. Uh, it has had a lot of use and sense, so it's not quite, it doesn't have the mirror polish that it came out to. But in that about showing off, point being is that uh, really you cannot go wrong with going, getting yourself a good chef knife. I mean, if there's one thing you absolutely should not get from the dollar store, it would be a chef's knife. Um, even they sell these. They sell those crappy things with um, um, at the dollar store with the plastic handle. Is the part I really don't like about them is that they most of them have serrated edges, a very fine serrated edge, which means that things are impossible to sharpen. And so, as they say, you know how they say that a sharp knife is much, much safer than a dull knife. And believe me, I have seen that in person. That is one of the big reasons why those dollar store uh, chef's knives are dangerous. And I would not recommend that to anyone. There are some things, quite a few things that you can buy at the dollar store for your kitchen, but a chef knife would not be one of them. Um, 
What's oh, what's for supper? Okay, hi, Castar and Matt from Modesto. Hi, Castar and Matt, Flatlands of Northern Indiana. Uh, hello from New Jersey. New U.S. Marine knives are K bar knives. Cutco is cray expensive. Yeah, that's true. Um, actually, a lot of people I know didn't even know that uh, K bar made kitchen knives. Um, so my guess is, is that. I have no idea how to date this thing. I would guess it would be anywhere from middle to late 20th century um, in that they probably produced a line of kitchen knives and may have discontinued them because, of course, you know, their hunter's knives and their military knives are far, far more popular. But anyway, getting back to uh, taking care of that. As I said, one thing you really, really need is a good chef's knife. And actually, chef's knives do not have to be ridiculously expensive. A lot of people do go out of their way to get those kind of things. I mean, as I said, no, you should not go to the dollar store for these things. On the other hand, the ones they sell even at Walmart, yeah, Walmart, are not bad. They are not the greatest, but they will work very well, especially if you do your best to sharpen them. So, I mean, it's just a step up, a step, a chef knife running anywhere from, I don't know, 10 to $20 or so is a really good starter investment. And in fact, you, if you're lucky, you may even have access to things like a restaurant store where you could uh, get a really, really nice dex, uh, uh, chef's knife from a brand like, say, Dexter Russell, for instance. Those are the ones that they actually use in those restaurants all the time. So um, <clears throat> a chef's knife is absolutely essential. And this isn't exactly going to be a tutorial on knives, but a point being, I guess, just that is that uh, you don't have to spend a whole ton of money on your sh first chef knife. A lot of people will, of course, be showing off things like their Shun and their Global Knives, and uh, they're all great, and I'm very happy. I'm very happy for them. <laughs> when I first got started in this foodie thing, I started saving up my, you know, the first really decent knife I got was a Victorinox, you know, that's probably the most popular knife on the internet, and it is a wonderful knife. I very, very do highly recommend that if you want to uh, spend maybe about $30 or so so and get a really great chef knife. After that, I started saving up my pennies because, yeah, I wanted a global chef knife too. Uh, but along the way, I kind of took a detour only because uh, my foodie hobby has been a little different from most in that, as you know, I become something obsessed with vintage cast iron. And that means taking care of cast iron, regularly washing and oiling my pants. It's a ritual that I have to do to keep them going. And so anyway, I discovered the wonders of carbon steel uh, knives, not just the stainless ones, but the ones that can indeed rust if you don't carefully take care of them, and they do have to be sharpened almost every day. And I thought, I'm, I love the idea because it had a nice vintage feel to it. And because of this, this one is great, but for a uh, regular daily user, I made an investment and, and ended up with a carbon steel Sabatier uh, knife. Uh, which is, yeah, this one costs probably about 70 to $80 or so, but the investment has definitely been worth it. I have put this thing through its paces, unfortunately, and while I've done my best to keep this thing sharp, I do feel I have to have this thing done by a professional sharpener because the blade is actually very, very slightly, well, I don't know what you want, curved, but it is still great for everyday use. Um, anyway, I guess the point being is, as I said, Sorry. you cannot, that's okay. You can now go with a, uh, you, you know, really need a good chef knife for your kitchen. Um, and that means, of course, you need things to take care of your chef knife. If you have a carbon steel one, well, then, of course, you need to have things to uh, keep it clean and keep it from rusting. And, that, and that's where I go into uh, my old friend, barkeeper's friend. This is actually something you really need to have in your kitchen, especially if you want to take care of cast iron, too, because this stuff here is a great rust remover. And as you know, that because with cast iron, just about you will end up having to clean up a rusty pan uh, one time or another, even something that may have just been left in the sink overnight by <clears throat> a friend or a family member. And uh, then it's developed some rust. And after you beat them over the head with your cast iron pan and you make them clean it up, 
be sure to break out the barkeeper's friend to help remove the rust. You can use vinegar too as well, but I love using barkeeper's friend. And as I said, this is also good for cleaning chef's knives as well. Uh, I guess from there we can get into a couple of other things as well really to use a, with a uh, knife. And that, of course, is a decent honing rod, which I find in a lot of kitchens, a lot of people get these things and then they throw them in the back of a drawer and they never use them. Even with a stainless steel knife, a honing rod is really, really great for keeping your knives up uh, decent and sharp because, again, a uh, dull knife is more dangerous than a sharp knife. Uh, and I am not, unfortunately, one of those knife sharpeners who can make get my knives so smooth that I could shave the hair off my arm with it. However, just uh, using this to hone my knives, I find I actually do a pretty decent job with it. Actually, that's the thing. This, this particular chef knife here sounds pretty dull when I sharpen it. It's actually got a very modest personality. Yeah, you know, everybody knows very well, you're in kitchen utensils, they definitely have their own personalities. This one sounds pretty dull. Whereas on the other hand, when I bring out the K-bar, you can listen to this. Oops, yeah, I hit the microphone, I don't know. You can hear a much better ring when you do this. This K-bar here is a real show-off, that's for sure. <clears throat> and anyway, uh, especially when dealing with carbon steel as well, as I said, you have to keep it from rusting, and that's why you have to take the extra step in addition and use mineral oil and a, a decent cloth. This is a chamois, for the record, that, I've, uh, that I uh, use um, mineral oil on regularly just to sharpen my knives. And because of this, it's soaked in mineral oil, and so... All I have to do is give it a good wipe uh, after I'm done washing and uh, sharpening it. So really, taking care of a good knife is not that hard. And let me see what else we might have here. Uh, U.S. Marine Knives question. Any thought on Damascus knives, the swirly metal kind? And another says get a knife block or a way of storing knives without throwing them in a utensil drawer. Okay, absolutely. Both of those questions. First, absolutely. Yes, no arguments there. And you can't see it with the camera here, but I've got one of those magnetic uh, knife bars that I stick my knives onto. I do not, do not, do not keep your knives in a drawer. That, of course, is dangerous. Anybody can reach in and cut it, not cut themselves. Not to mention, of course, that the knives could be damaged or bent or dented or anything like that just from rattling around in that drawer. Sorry, sorry. What? But, but look, you yeah. do have one of these. So. Oh, yeah, you're right. Right here. Yeah, that's true. I ended up actually getting this one for free at Harbor Freight Tools, and I still have nowhere to hang it. However, it's a good way to demonstrate it. Yeah, I mean, what can I say? It's like I've got a nice uh, magnetic knife bar here. And these things are great because, hey, you can use this to keep the knives out of the reach of your kids or anybody else. Uh, I know some people question about whether to hang them down or up. I personally am a believer in up for only because it's a little bit safer. I'm clumsy and I tend to stumble against things and I really do not want to stumble against my the sharp edge of a knife. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this thing is, I, well, not this one. I actually have another one. This one, as I said, is a spare that I'm trying to find a use for. <laughs> um, however, yes, uh, somebody else said a knife block, which is also great. And you can usually get those things cheap, too. You can get them used at places like uh, flea markets or thrift stores or the like. The thing I don't like about them, um, I do not recommend buying a knife block of full of brand new knives and that's but that's only my experience some people may say otherwise what i find with a knife block is you spend all that money for a block full of knives you will end up using may two maybe three of those knives all the rest of them will sit in there gathering dust for years so the investment really is not worth it because you're barely going to get any use out of it i ended up building up my knife collection bit by bit based on really what I needed and sometimes what I wanted. <laughs> uh, just this year, for instance, I was on a uh, trip through Pennsylvania and I visited one of the 
best meat markets in the entire area. You may have even heard of it. It's called Dietrich's Meat Market. It's in uh, northern Pennsylvania, uh, maybe about half an hour north of, of uh, Harrisburg, and I forget the town that it's in. And lo and behold, they had a sale on some of their extra knives. So no, uh, so for five dollars. I ended up getting a uh, used boning knife from one of the best meat markets in the whole area. You can bet they've given it a lot of use. And lo and behold, it turned out to be a Victorinox. So I got a Victorinox boning knife for five bucks. <laughs> yeah, you, sometimes you, you get lucky like that. Um, okay, the other thing was, uh, any thoughts on Damascus knives, the swirly metal kind? Uh, I do not own one of those. They look beautiful. Um, if you're into really, really high-end knives, you can probably um, know, you know a lot more about that than I do. And in fact, uh, there is a great, great YouTube channel that I will recommend. It is called Burrfection, B-U-R-R, Fection. The guy there is obsessed with sharpening knives, and he's done a wonderful job with all kinds of Japanese knives, and he does a lot with those really swirly, fancy Damascus knives. Um, he does mention as well that some of the ones you see as Damascus knives uh, that you see online in places like eBay and the like are ripoffs, so buyer beware. Um, if you're really going to spend a lot of money on a, uh, on a knife, obviously you should do some research first with a trusted source. Um, well, let me see. From there, we're 20 minutes in, and already we barely started here, only because there's so much to do. Uh, I mean, heck, heck, I could mention I got this nice uh, Santoku as well from uh, Japan you know, that I spent a little bit of money for and uh, got this. A Santoku is a really, really wonderful knife, especially for chopping vegetables and the like. So I'm, I'm very happy with it. The brand of this one, I think, is Tojiro. Um, but anyway, let's go, let's go on because, as I said, there's a lot more to your kitchen that you need for cooking than knives. You, I mean, after all, you, you can't cook food over a hot pan with a knife. How can you flip it? And here, I guess we can get into another subject, and I guess that would be spatulas of all kinds. <laughs> and actually, I think I'll answer the question here regarding cast iron. A lot of people say, can you use metal utensils on a cast iron pan or not? And the answer, of course, is yes. You can use them. You can beat up your cast iron. You can do all kinds of fancy things and scrape the pan while cooking. That's how you can get off the fond on the bottom, you know, the wonderful brown bits that you get from searing foods and the like. You scrape it off with your spatula. And here, that's the thing, is that if you've got a wooden spatula, you really can't scrape it off that well. On the other hand, it will scratch the seasoning, of course, on your cast iron. And while that, in the long run, that's really nothing to worry about. The seasoning will build up as you keep using it, which is why it's fine to use metal utensils on cast iron. Yet, on the other hand, I like using wooden utensils on my cast iron as well. I've got this uh, wooden spatula that I paid $2 for this at uh, Family Dollar or Dollar General or one of those things. It's nice and thick. Uh, this one actually is a wooden wok spatula that I paid something like three dollars for, so at a Chinese market. I'm lucky in that there are a couple of really good Chinese markets in the area where I am, so. And I happen to pull out uh, this nice, thick, heavy, uh, stainless steel slotted spatula, which, you know, I mean, I mean obviously there are uses for all of these, um, but I guess that's the thing is that Wooden utensils, oh yeah, they work great on cast iron too, and a lot of mine, quite often I use wooden utensils. But yes, you can use metal utensils on cast iron if, or if you want to, or if you have to. And that's where we can go to our, uh, we can come up with all kinds of things, like this, nice, this cute little, uh, I don't know if they call this a spider or not, but this is definitely useful for uh, lifting uh, things out of hot, out of uh, hot oil, for instance, or of course we got ourselves a pasta spoon. This one actually is pretty cheap. I think I got this one, I found this one at Dollar Tree or something, and I really need to get a better one of these. On the other hand, of course, 
Let me dig out. Oh, come on. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. I can't miss this. My magic wand. <laughs> yeah, I just called this my magic wand only because I fell in love with this one when I found it at Brimfield, of course, of all places. And I paid five bucks for it. So this is a really nice, it's light but very durable metal made in Hong Kong um, wok spatula. And this thing is wonderful, really wonderful for uh, working on a cast iron wok. I just love this thing. On the other hand, of course, there's nothing wrong with you with getting a nice metal uh, wok spatula. And I guess I'll mention that as well. If you use a wok, this actually, quite frankly, this is absolutely essential. I have actually seen a couple of people who use regular spatulas in their wok. And yeah, it, it works okay. But when you get one of these, these things were designed for use with a wok. And, and once you use one of these, you can feel the difference. This thing is made for using a wok. And believe me, once you've used one of these, you will fall in love with it. And you will not want to use anything else with a wok. Very highly recommended. Oh yeah, this one is a longer spatula, of course, uh, but uh, really useful, especially for making breakfast when you're talking about things like omelets and pancakes and the like. Uh, uh, one other thing, I guess, and that would be plastic utensils. Um, now, using cast iron, as you know, uh, bare cast iron, yeah, you cannot use these things with bare cast iron. They will melt because eventually you will end up getting them on, on a hot pan and then uh, these things will be warped and worse. On the other hand, if you use enameled cast iron, this is absolutely essential. Stuff like this. We've got a uh, plastic, heavy plastic uh, ladle and uh, this one I like, a plastic uh, heavy thick plastic uh, spatula. I found this one at a uh, restaurant store really, really great for using with enameled cast iron for baking and the like. So um, I guess that's point. I guess I'll point that out in that you can use uh, metal utensils on bare cast iron, but do not use metal utensils with enameled cast iron. I mean, that, that of course will scratch the enamel and uh, eventually damage it. So, I mean, it's that means if you do use it, if you have enameled cast iron ware in your kitchen, you do have to get at least some uh, plastic utensils, especially for using that. Um, okay, somebody else goes on. Uh, and preferred, wo preferred wood for those utensils for uh, cast iron, mesquite, bamboo, etc. Um, I have to admit this is not my area of expertise which is why I can say again that I use this thing here that I bought for $2 at, uh, at uh, Dollar General. And you can bet this thing is probably not bamboo and it's not olive wood or anything like that. Uh, for all I know, this is pine. Um, car going by in the background. <laughs> um, but different kinds of wood... Um, I personally have not seen that much of a difference, but then again, I have to be honest and say, as I said, I'm not really an expert in that subject. So, uh, for instance, I managed to find this nice wooden ladle at an Indian market for about $4 or so. I mean, this thing has a coloring that looks like it might indeed be olive wood. And I know some people love olive wood. Um, I'm thinking it must really be maybe for the texture or something because I have not seen that much of a difference. Uh, howdy, howdy, all from Roadkill Stew. Hi. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so I'm sorry if that sounds so vague. Uh, on the other hand, I will say one thing about bamboo, of course. It is very, very light, which means when there is, you can actually uh, feel the difference, and bamboo is still uh, pretty durable, so... Uh, that's why a lot of Chinese utensils are made from uh, bamboo. And going through here, I guess we can uh, talk about things like good old tongs, of course. You know, you know, I I saw that joke recently. It's like you see these things. It's a law of nature. You take a, a pair of tongs out, 
you have to click it. It's a test click. Uh, I mean, you don't know if this thing's going to work or not unless you click it. So, <laughs> um, tongs are okay. I think, I'll, yeah, that's the subject I think I'll go back to. What can you get at the dollar store? And for a long time, I did, in fact, go with dollar store tongs and they work just fine. Uh, I ended up getting tired of the way they bent eventually, and I spent a little bit more money and got a, a decent pair of tongs at a restaurant store, but uh, there's really nothing wrong with using dollar store tongs, or for that matter, the dollar store metal um, <clears throat> spatulas uh, that they have there. They, are, they have several of those, or forks, or the like. Um, so yeah, getting stuff, I mean, believe me, there's, there's a lot of stuff you can get at Dollar Tree that really is worth it. And not just, uh, talking about utensils and the like, but also things like cloths, throwaway rags and the, and the like. So, um, at the dollar store last year, I found a nice set of, uh, pot holders, for instance, that I'll bring out again this, that, this Christmas, you know, stuff like that. Not to mention a decent supply of cheesecloth. You got that at Dollar Tree, and I'm very happy about that. So, no, I, I do not turn my nose up at Dollar Tree and Dollar, Channel, Dollar General. Those are great places, really, to shop for everyday useful items. I mean, if you really want to get a, yourself something really, really nice, and, of course, you've got to go someplace like Sur La Table or order online, or maybe, if you're lucky, get a uh, nice... Find a nice score at a flea market, which can happen now once in a while. So, I mean, as I mentioned, a number of these things I found out. Oh, yeah, here's something else. Not from the dollar store. Uh, this I did some years ago, and a lot of people kind of overlook these things. Metal measuring cups and measuring spoons. These things, I'm as I said, I paid, I don't know, maybe about 10 bucks or so total for this set of, of uh, cups and spoons, and they have been worth every penny of it. I mean, you get those plastic measuring cups and measuring spoons, they work all right, but the, uh, light, but the uh, measurements always wear off. It always happens, so you have to end up getting more of them again and again. I mean, really, make a, a nice investment and get yourself some metal measuring tools. They, that will very, very much be worth it. So that's why I can get things like a metal whisk, for instance. Or, and here's another thing I like, especially, um, I forget what they call these things. I think it, they call this thing a pastry cutter, but of course I use it naturally for scraping stuff off of the cutting board, especially chopped vegetables or the like. Uh, one of those things, I don't think they even have these things in metal at the dollar store, but it's definitely worth it if you can get someplace like a um, uh, job lot or the like. Um, okay, so far I've just been going around through utensils, I guess. We'll get back to cast iron. Uh, in that, as I mentioned before, you can get yourself, you know, a, um, you've got yourself a cast iron skillet. You do definitely need to get yourself a Dutch oven in one way or another. I mean, this one happens to be a Griswold Dutch oven. One of those things, as I think I mentioned, I was lucky enough to score this at Brimfield for 10 bucks. But not everybody can be this lucky. Um, the large Dutch oven is wonderful. The bit, uh, if you wanted to get your first Dutch oven, I would recommend the Bear Dutch oven, probably like from Lodge or maybe even Camp Chef. After a while, you would probably want to take the extra step and get an enamel Dutch oven because those are, of course, very useful for the reason why we use enameled stuff. And, you know, that's really great for cooking tomato dishes, dishes with lots of vinegar and the like. Uh, from there, I think we can go to a stock pot, for instance. And here is where I learned my lesson that, unfortunately, no, you can't cook everything in cast iron. <clears throat> yeah, I said that. You can't cook everything in cast iron. Um, namely boiling water. You can boil water in cast iron, but it will eventually affect the seasoning. The seasoning will wear down if you use something for boiling water too much, and it can uh, affect your food. Um, and I found that there are some dishes that really do not work well with water boiled in cast iron, and that's why you have to get an enamel pot or a stock pot. 
there, here's one thing again, and most of your places like Walmart or the like, if you go to a there and find a stock part for boiling water, it will probably be stainless steel. And yes, those are good for boiling water. If you have a stainless steel stock pot, you probably use it almost every day uh, until you discover, like I discovered, how wonderful it is to use an aluminum stock pot for boiling water. These, I mean, these things here, those things are absolutely great. You will get your water boiling in, I don't know, in like about 10 seconds. Well, I've exaggerated. More like about 10 minutes or so. And once you get a stock pot, an aluminum stock pot, you will use it almost every day. Let me show off, I guess. I've shown this thing off before, which of course is a, in my case, it's a Wagner Dutch oven. Uh, that has the Wagner logo on it. And as you can see, it's part of their Magnolite line. Um, I actually do have a larger aluminum stock pot. But to be honest, I don't use it very much, but that's only because of the way I cook. You know, it's like I live by myself. I cook mostly for myself and my roommate, Jamie. So for the two of us, this works just great for boiling water. But if you've got a big family, you'll probably need a bigger stock pot and I do recommend going to try aluminum, whether that means, again, finding it at a flea market or, or if you may want to even go out of your way and go to a uh, Chinese market or even a restaurant store. Because, uh, again, once you get one of those, it will, um, you will be using it almost every day. Clank. <laughs> Question. Glock 30 fan. Oh, I have found some utensils at my local Ross store. Yes, that uh, uh, question. Do you, uh, Glock 30 fan, do you use carving forks or other forks when you cook? My grandmother insisted on her very old forks when she cooked. Not sure why. I don't use a, a carving fork that much. I think this is one of those things that you, it's an acquired skill. If you grew up using a carving fork, you will probably always use it because it is useful. You know, that's what you use forks for, to hold down the meat as you cut it. And yeah, while you're cooking, uh, I suppose you could use the fork in one hand and maybe even the spatula in the other. But, of course, no, a lot of us don't do that. I don't do that much. I do have a carving fork, which I use maybe about once a year <laughs> when I carve the, the uh, Thanksgiving turkey. So uh, another question from Glock30 uh, fan. Uh, is bigger always better when it comes to Dutch ovens? As big as you can afford, really, any cast iron, go bigger when you, whenever you can? Well, no. Uh, it's more like a question of use rather than just getting it because it's big. Um, everybody has their own tastes and their own styles. I mean, you've got somebody, for instance, who just, who just loves his low country boils and his Brunswick stews and, you know, again, cooking for his, uh, for his church and his family and his school and his whole neighborhood and the like, well, that guy, of course, is going to have himself one huge, gigantic, uh, Dutch oven. If you've got a, uh, you know, for most families, I think a standard size Dutch oven will do okay. Uh, you can probably even do uh, okay with a nice bigger Dutch oven, you know, like maybe of the eight quart size or so. Um, for most people, I think that's probably about as big as you're really going to need. Uh, you will get a lot of use out of a pan that size. No question about that. I mean, especially, again, if you've got yourself a nice big family to feed. So uh, I would say really go bigger. Well, for two reasons. One, if you find you really do need a bigger pot. And two, if you're if you've got a hobby or an obsession, no, I'm not saying who, and you find, oh God, I've got to get that. I just, I just can't say no. <laughs> um, and which is why I ended up with a uh, Birmingham stove and range number 12 Dutch oven. Let me, give me a second for that. Ugh. Oh yeah. Ugh. So, yeah, 
This thing is sure is heavy. Um, but I do actually do my best to use this thing. I mean, you saw the video where I made that big pot of Boston baked pork and beans, for instance. <laughs> One reason why I like having this YouTube channel is it gives me excuses to pull out big pots like this. And I'd say it's getting well past time to use this one again. So uh, this one will probably be showing up soon. Mm. Oh, boy. Mm. So I guess the answer really is get what you need so that you can be sure you're going to get a fair amount of use from it. And of course, that differs from everyone. Somebody else says, I have a tri uh, Techman 71. I have a tri-clad stainless steel stock pot. I like that aluminum stock pot you have. Well, yes, <laughs> uh, tri-clad. Is that uh, tri-clad? Is that all clad or is that maybe one of those brands that uh, takes after all clad if so then uh, you've got that means you do have a pretty good one it's probably i would guess an aluminum center and stainless steel plating well by all means get uh, as much use as you like out of that hmm. greetings from mexico hector noriega hi i've seen you commenting on my channel well once again thank you very much so all right um Okay, so I've uh, talked a little bit about utensils. I've talked about cooking uh, utensils. Uh, I do have a few things in my kitchen that a lot that some people don't have, or maybe they have, but they, it's just sitting there gathering dust. Stuff like this, uh, this mortar and pestle. Because again, I found there are some things I like doing the old-fashioned way, and for me, that would include grinding spices, for instance, and that um, I had an electric spice grinder, but I rarely have ever used it. Um, but anyway, it, as besides, using stuff like this is fun. I find it to be a lot of fun. But maybe that's because I've only been cooking for the last 10 years and I haven't been doing it my whole life and I don't have to do it to feed my whole family. <laughs> so that's there is a difference there. Um, going on. Okay, I've talked about uh, utensils. I've talked about a basic, um, okay, the basics for cast iron. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we've got your, your uh, stock pot. We've got a Dutch oven. We've got, a, uh, we've got a, a cast iron skillet. And, of course, they make cast iron pans of all shapes and sizes. And from there, it's really a question of going with uh, where you feel you will get some use out of it. Uh, sometimes you may end up succumbing to temptation, which I guess is why just last week I did actually end up getting the brand new Lodge <laughs> cast iron pie plate. Now, the thing is, of course, do I really need this cast iron pie plate? Well, no. Because, well, yes, yes, I need it. I mean, because, yeah, you can bake pies in it. Oh, and by the way, you, this is a skillet, too. I mean, it's cast iron. There's no reason why you can't fry stuff in it. In my case, of course, I've got a whole bunch of skillets. And uh, so in that case, this is kind of like a luxury in that I ended up succumbing to weakness. But then again, a lot of people do that. Do that. You know, they got a few things in their uh, kitchen that they want that they really want more than they need <laughs> but yeah i'll find an excuse to uh, get use out of this and yeah there will be an unboxing video on this probably within the next week or so <laughs> um okay well speaking of kitchen items i guess i'll get down to other things like for instance again mentioning uh taking care of cast iron one question that oh yeah uh, Glock 30 fan again. Oh, great scratching, great green scratchy pads, mothers. Repeat until done. Absolutely. And somebody, uh, Raymond says, I recently found a Griswold aluminum nine Dutch oven. I started using mother's aluminum polish by hand to bring out, out the shine. Any shortcuts you can offer? Thanks. Uh, I would like to know myself. My Wagner Dutch oven was in pretty was in great condition when I bought it, so I was lucky to start out from the beginning. Um, I don't know, but I would think again that old barkeeper's friend should work okay to help uh, bring the shine back to that. But I should really look into more into an aluminum polish that's food safe. I guess that's that's the thing you have to uh, consider. Uh, somebody else said green scratchy pads, mothers. Repeat until done. Oh, no question about that because, hey, look what I've got here. 
Um, if you use cast iron in your kitchen, you will live on these green scratchy pads. These. Yeah, really the, the, yeah. Well, yeah. Yes and no. Um, let me say the uh, green scratchy pads. Um, most of the time, these have to come from places not Dollar Tree, unfortunately, because, yeah, they do sell these things at Dollar Tree. But the ones they have are generally not as good. They are not as stiff, not as scratchy. They're a little softer, and they're fine for washing your dishes every day. But if you really want a nice green scratchy pad, you've got to go... I don't know, probably like Lowe's or even Walmart or the like and get the real thing, get the Scotch brand one. Because these things are absolutely, you. as I said, if you use cast iron, you will live on these for uh, cleaning your cast iron. Unless you take the investment and get something else for cleaning your cast iron. And I guess uh, I mentioned this in the washing video, but I see no reason not to mention it again here. And that, of course, would be a, a chain mail scrubber. Um, the, when, again, for you, for cleaning cast iron, this, these things here are wonderful. I got this thing, uh, on, when did I get it? 2012, I think I said it was, Christmas of 2012. I've been using it almost every day, and yet this thing here still looks almost as, uh, good as new. So, but then again, I, as I said, I've done my best not to abuse it. So I realize that for a lot of people, you get several years out of this thing, the rings will start uh, bending or even uh, breaking and the like. So, however, even then, you, that's several years of use. These scratchy pads here are also wonderful for cleaning cast iron, but how long, how much use can you get out of this? Maybe a couple of weeks if you're lucky, which means you've got to keep buying more. Again, there's nothing wrong with this. These things are really great. Take them camping, use them every day. Uh, for a long-term investment, a chainmail scrubber is really, really useful. Well, Just what is after you're done using on your pots and pans, you can use it on your bathroom. Well, yes, that's true, too. The uh, scrubby, yes. When you're done with the pots and pans, you can use it on your bathroom floor. And then throw it out because I don't think you want to use it on your pans again after, you, after you've uh, scrubbed your floor with it. <laughs> I need my two cents myself, sorry. No, that's okay. Not to change the subject, but what is the necklace I see you wear? What symbol is that or the meaning? Well... This is something, if you go online and look up the Star of Chaos, you will get a lot of uh, information about that. It comes from Michael Moorcock, the science fiction author, and it was popularized as well in this game called Warhammer 40,000, which, to be honest, I have uh, never played, but uh, my reasoning has more to do with uh, it being the Star of Chaos. <laughs> And uh, that's going to be another subject for another video that I'm probably going to do about ne uh, next month or so, in fact. <laughs> um, however, uh, Brassel works just wonderful. Just don't use it on the inside. Okay. Um, hey, let's talk. Let me see. Since we're mentioning again, uh, taking care of cast iron, I think I'll answer one other thing. Uh, one question that was posted on my Facebook uh, page as well is that please mention the type of oils you use for seasoning cast iron. And that is an, one of those arguments that has been going on and will keep going on. So uh, I myself am a big fan fan of Crisco, in fact. I keep myself, this is a little cast iron serving dish. It's a made in China thing that part of a set my brother gave me for Christmas. Um, I keep regularly uh, Crisco in this thing here, not for cooking, but rather just for seasoning my, just for oiling my pans down after I, after I wash them every day. Uh, like I said, I did that washing video a couple of weeks ago, so I don't have to go too much into too much detail on that. But I find Crisco works really great, not just for oiling your pans, but it also does great for seasoning cast iron. Pretty much almost any oil will work fine for seasoning cast iron. When you heat the oil up past its smoke point, it carbonizes, or in other words, it burns, a layer of seasoning onto the pan, and that will do just about any one you want. Uh, a higher smoke point oil is probably decent, which is why I am a fan of Crisco in that, or I am even a fan of, here's, here we go, product plug that they're not paying me for. 
and that would be Crisby. Uh, you know, this was one of the first and most popular uh, cast iron uh, seasoning pucks. I do realize this thing called Buzzy Wax has come out as well, and I realize it's probably as good as Crisby, but uh, I am a fan of Crisby only because I've been using it really so for the past several years to clean my cast iron. This stuff here is a combination of beeswax and Crisco. So, in fact, uh, a few years ago, I can't, I acquired some a bunch of uh, sticks of beeswax, and I used that for seasoning my pans. But really, when it comes to seasoning your pans in the oven, you can use Crisco, you can use uh, Crisby, you can use vegetable oil, you can use lard, bacon grease. Um, pretty much anyone will work just fine for seasoning your cast iron. Um, the real trick, of course, is the method that you use. Uh, it's also true, though, of course, that once it's see once that your cast iron is seasoned, then there's the question of how durable it is, and that's where I think I should mention I am sick and tired of that stupid flaxseed oil being pushed as the greatest thing ever for seasoning cast iron. That stuff, first of all, it's expensive. Uh, you, you really can't do anything else with it other than maybe season your cast iron. I'm not even sure what else they use that flaxseed oil stuff for because it's really not meant for cooking. You really can't mix it into your food. So why go out of your way to spend $9 on a uh, bottle of organic flaxseed oil Went to season your pans when you can very well just use some from that big tub of Crisco that you already use for uh, cooking with, and it will work just as well. Also, on the Cast Iron Cooking Group, uh, there have been quite a few reports that uh, pans seasoned with flaxseed oil have tended, the seasoning has started flaking off after only a short period of time, or maybe a couple of years or so. And I will say that happened to me as well. Uh, I do have a um, link uh, that I posted online some time ago, and I should put on this video as well, uh, where I actually spent some time seasoning uh, one pan with flaxseed oil and another pan with regular vegetable oil, and I took lots and lots of photographs, having photographic evidence, uh, and I found out that there was really no difference in quality between the flaxseed oil pan and the uh, vegetable oil pan, seasoned pan. They both work great, um, and there's nothing wrong, I guess, with using flaxseed oil, but as I said, it's so expensive, and it's really not good for anything else, and for that reason, I do not recommend it. It's not really not useful enough. Alton Brown doesn't like unitaskers in the kitchen, and I have done my best to follow his advice, uh, because you can get a lot of use out of, well, just about all of these things. Even that cast iron pie pan, like I said, you can use it as a skillet too. <laughs> I did I did all my cast iron with flaxseed. That is Raymond, okay? And feel free to uh, use it. Um, as I said, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, go ahead and, and cook to your heart's content because after all, it's your cast iron, it's your kitchen, and, and I do want you to get as much enjoyment from it as you can, so. Uh, and since and I somebody else says Glock 30 fan says I've heard you should only use butter bacon fat or lard as a seasoning oil if you use that piece daily or it will start to smell in a couple of days true or false um, I've never heard using butter to actually season your cast iron. However, it is true that <clears throat> when you use vegetable oil uh, to season, to grease your pans regularly, yes, after a few days, if you don't use it, it will start to get, go rancid and get sticky and smelly. Uh, and I've got a fairly large cast iron collection. There's no way I can go through all of these things in the space of a few days, which is one thing I found as well, uh, is that one reason why I like using Crisco just to grease my pans, because this stuff here uh, lasts a lot longer. I believe you can probably uh, grease a pan with Crisco instead of uh, vegetable oil, and it will probably last at least a couple of months or so before it starts to go, uh, you know, before it starts to go rancid, so, uh, which is a lot better than just a few days. 
The reason for that, as I understand it, is because this is like hydrogenated vegetable oil. So as a result, it is more resistant to going rancid and it will last a lot longer. And I will say this only once. No, I am not interested in uh, garbage about, oh, uh, Crisco and soybean oil, they're bad for you, GMOs. No. Uh, end of story. Besides the fact that that's false, I'm not interested in that garbage. That is conspiracy theory stuff. On the other hand, as I said, I do recommend, as, again, I keep, uh, I keep, I use Crisco to grease my pans regularly rather than vegetable oil for precisely that reason, that <clears throat> my pans will last a lot longer between uses because I'm using Crisco to grease them. Maybe I should get Crisco to pay me for that. Um, uh, let me see, jump keys. Only because we have a hog every six months, we have plenty of bacon, grease, and lard poured off every day. Well, then there you go. You can definitely use bacon grease to grease your pans, and you can use it to season your pans in the oven as well. You will probably have pans that are nice and black and shiny and nonstick, which is the way cast iron should be. So, great. I have no complaints at all. Uh, I remember, I know I seasoned a couple of my big pots with lard a few years ago as well, so I know how that is. JD, I can't identify one of my pans, hammered sides, and lettering on bottom. <clears throat> is there a good book or site to help? Well, yeah, Facebook. <laughs> Um, the Cast Iron Cooking Group has uh, 270,000 plus people who love uh, cooking in cast iron. If you post a photo of your picture to the uh, photo of your picture, a photo of your pan, the bottom of the pan to the Cast Iron Cooking Group, it's almost certain they will be able to identify it for you just like that. From what I know of hammered pans, uh, if you have lettering on the bottom, you may very well have a uh, Chicago hardware foundry pan, which is really nice and uh, wonderful to have that. So yeah, definitely post a picture to the Cast Iron Cooking Group because people will, will go, wow, and everybody, and you'll get a ton of likes from it. So um, you will, pr it's probably Chicago Hardware Foundry. There's a much smaller chance. It could even be a lodge or maybe even a hammered Wagner. They did actually make hammered pans, a few of them, but most likely it could be Chicago Hardware. There are also the ugly hammered pans, which are also great. And, and there's nothing wrong with having one of those as well. I have a couple of ugly hammered skillets myself. J-E-P, uh, J-P says, do you still use a lye bath or e-tank to strip old and vintage pans? And if you use e-tank, where can you find a manual battery charger? Or you, I just can't find a manual one, just automatic. Yeah, that's a real problem, isn't it? I love my lye tank. My lye tank is uh, outside right now, and it's uh, got several pieces, in fact, that I'm going to be... Uh, <coughs> cleaning up and seasoning within the next couple of weeks or so as the weather starts to turn cooler. Just the other day at a flea market, I was lucky enough to find a BSR uh, a fish fryer that had been painted red. I've dropped that in the lye tank, and I'll be cleaning that up as well. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to do a video for that, especially since I made a mistake. Uh, I was bad. I dropped that thing in the lye tank before I tested the paint for lead. So uh, there may be a risk that I could very well have ruined everything in the lie tank. On the other hand, I think the risk is extremely small. Um, lead paint has been banned now going on almost 40 to 50 years. So I think the odds now are, is getting smaller every day that, there, that any particular painted piece was actually done with lead paint. However, I still can't be absolutely sure. And when I pull that thing out of the lie tank, the first thing I'm going to do, it will be to uh, give it a lead test. So that was my mistake, and I'm admitting that right here. But, well, I'll find out along with anybody. I feel there's a good chance, though, that it will be uh, just fine. Uh, I always have a few extra chargers also for Dutch oven crack open the lids to let the air out. Yeah, no question about that. And like every, 
Um, I have a few of these things for uh, placing between the, uh, you know, the Dutch oven and the lid. This one was a gift from my mom, in fact. This is a Farberware. I've actually seen these things on sale at Dollar Tree recently. So, yeah, that's one of those things. Yes, you can get Dollar Tree at Dollar Tree. And, of course, you don't have to use something fancy like this. You can use paper towels or even dollar store cloths or rags. Just all you need is a little crack to, uh, you know, uh, between the, um, your Dutch oven and the lid. And the reason why is to have a little bit of circulation so that there will be air on the inside as well as on the outside. It will help uh, a little bit more, at least, to keep you, the seasoning on the inside of your uh, Dutch oven from going bad. <clears throat> And what else do we have? Thanks for this video. Am I imagining, did you say in one of your uh, past videos that something like lard can't go rancid if it's already been carbonized while seasoning? Um, yeah. Okay, no, the difference is this. When it's been carbonized, meaning, yeah, that you're just burning it on to the, uh, burning a layer onto that, uh, that is different than just greasing your pans every day after you wash it. Uh, the whole point of the carbonization is just that. It is a layer of carbon. And that is not going to go bad because, you know, it doesn't have any uh, organic material in it. It, doesn't, it does not have that consistency. So the seasoning uh, should not go bad in that respect. After a number of years of use, it could very well start to flake off of the like, but it's not going to go rancid. That's different from greasing your pan every day after you wash it. I'm one of those people who does that, partly because I have an electric stove. There are some people who don't do that. They do it kind of backwards in that they wash the pan and then put it on the uh, stove and, or they grease it and then put it on the stove until it smokes uh, and then let it cool off and that's how they do it. I think Jeff Rogers does it that way in fact. But of course, I don't have a uh, gas stove so I can't do it that way. I am so instead, I do just wash my uh, cast iron and I uh, grease and so I oil it. Like I said, I use Crisco rather than vegetable oil because it does last a little longer. Um, jump keys. I actually do have an electric stove. I even use an induction plate for my iron when my stove is full. Oh, yes. <laughs> I know that feeling all too well. <laughs> uh, one thing about using an electric stove. I found this out, and there's at least one video online that has shown this as well. With an electric stove top, do not use your cast iron on an electric stove top with the burner turned up all the way to the maximum. On an electric stove top, that can actually get hot enough to eventually warp your pan. It gets to something like maybe as much as 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. And that goes past the point where, yes, it can actually affect your iron and damage it and cause it to warp. As you know, that means you've got yourself a spinner. So uh, it may not, I mean, it probably won't happen just after one or two uses. But when I first started out in cooking, I did not know any better. And I was constantly blasting my cast iron at high uh, almost every time I cooked. In the first place, yes, I did have, a, I did get a couple of fires in my pan. I will say that. You saw that video, you may have seen that video where I set my stovetop on fire. That's how I did it. I blasted it on an electric stove for like about, I don't know, probably about 20 to 30 minutes. So it was so hot that just a couple of drops of uh, canola oil started that pan on fire. Um, on the other hand as well, um, one thing I did is, you know, my thick lodge cast iron wok, you know, the, uh, let me bring that out in fact, rather than just say it. Yeah, you too. Yeah, I'm talking about this one, my Lodge cast iron wok that I've used so much. The truth is, this is a spinner. I warped it because, I've, as I said, for the first couple of years or so, as I was uh, using, as using this, I was blasting this on an electric stove top at its maximum heat for almost the entire time. Um, and so as a result, it actually is warped in the center. Funny thing is, of course, for a wok, that's really not so bad because you know what warping does? It gives you a hot spot in the center. 
And yeah, with a WAP, that's what you want. That's the sweet spot. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't want that for a skillet or a Dutch oven. And so if you use a skillet at maximum heat on an electric stovetop, over time, it's eventually going to warp. So do not use an electric stovetop at maximum heat with your cast iron. The most I would do is probably like maybe up to three quarters or 75% or seven to eight or so on out of 10 on the dial and no more than that. I hope that helps. <clears throat> all right, let's see what else. Uh, Robert Tyler Wood, you've pointed out all the things that prevent good cooking on stoves, warping, prevent good cooking. Oh yeah. Warping, fire damage, etc. But what if you want to cook on a campfire? Are there still things to avoid? I'm not a co an outdoor cooking expert and you can probably get a lot more and better advice than from, from someone else than from me. Um, I would probably take what I've said here and apply that to outdoors because that doesn't change too much. Um, the question is, of course, as I've said many times, do not throw your cast iron into the fire, meaning you've got yourself a big roaring fire. And a lot of people often say, "I clean." that's how I clean off years and decades of seasoning on my cast iron. I put, I get, I put it in the coals till it's red hot and then let it cool. Yeah. And that's how you can crack your cast iron because it gets over that, that, that point, as I mentioned, something like 1100 to 1200 degrees. On the other hand, it's, there's a difference between putting your cast iron in the fire and cooking over the fire. You know, I mean, that's, that's what these things are made for. If you want to get yourself in your grill or your campfire, you put a grill over the campfire or something, go at it. That's really what these things are for. Um, that's, that's, I guess, the best thing. Well, no, that's not true. One other thing I do know and experience from camping is, of course, again, your cast iron is almost certainly going to rust outdoors because, you know, it's so humid and the humidity. A lot of people will wake up and get out of their tent in the morning and find that the cast iron has been left over the uh, uh, over the fire and it's got itself a nice coating of uh, flash rust. So uh, one thing that I did discover of all things that can actually prevent this from uh, from uh, rusting like that is vinegar in that I took in that when I went camping with a, a companion once we took a spray bottle full of vinegar and we went after after we cleaned the cast iron mind you after we greased it up and then gave it a spritz of vinegar not a soaking or anything but just a spritz and that actually prevent that was enough to prevent it from rusting. So um, I don't know what it would do to the seasoning in the long run. But then again, we were only camping for a couple of days. So uh, Ryan Han Hanley, thanks for the insight. I have in the past started using carbon steel more, but I appreciate your videos. Well, thank you very much. Uh, did your early, oh, your early videos got me into cooking. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, Pappy Dan, I have the twin to your BSR number 14 skillet, but I'm leery to use it on the kitchen stove because the stove element is smaller than the skillet. Do you use yours on the stove? Sometimes. I'm, I've got a big enough collection that I don't have to. I mean, among other things, I've got that BSR oval fish fryer, which works great when you lay it over two burners on the stove right there. However, um, I have used my uh, BSR on top of the stove a couple of times. And what I do is I do that. I just lay it over two burners rather than one. I mean, yeah, that means rather than in the center, you don't get the hot spot, but you do get the two hot spots at the top and bottom parts of the uh, skillet where it is sitting, where it is sitting on top of the stove. So yes, you can use it, and it's a great way to show off to friends and the like. <laughs> um, I've taken old Stumpy, my BSR fourteen. I've taken him on uh, trips to visit my dear friends who live in Midstate New York. And I and from there, I have actually used old Stumpy on the uh, stove top in exactly that manner. Cooked a nice, great, big stir fry uh, on the stove top in that way with that fourteen. Uh, 
And, and uh, hello to uh, Kevin Tunnel or Tunnel. Thank you very much. I love my BSR fish fryer. Oh, yeah, no, that is such a great pan. Let me bring that out, in fact. Yeah, I find myself using this thing a lot, my BSR fish fryer here. Um, this one, actually, fortunately, is the older one, the first generation one, or the Red Mountain series one. You can tell, of course, because it's got the uh, because it's got the angled handle. When they redesigned it in the '60s, that's when they gave it the uh, old the round handle. But this thing is wonderful because it does it fits on top of two burners on the stove. So yeah, that means you, it's pretty much like a double or a uh, double length skillet. And unlike that BSR 14, which is great, but I mean, this one will work really great, especially for making like say eggs and bacon in the morning, because you know, you can do the hot spots here and then move it in the center where it's cooler as you are, as you are cooking. These things are really great. Uh, another plug, I guess, Lodge Cast Iron. Uh, their new bakeware series, they just came out with a couple of, uh, well, square, not oval pans, but are wonderful size. One is a 9 by 13 rectangular cast iron pan, and another one is even bigger. I think it's something like maybe uh, something like 10 by 15 or 10 by 17 or something. So uh, you, people may even want to consider that if they're not lucky enough to find one of these oval fryers. They do sell the Asian-made ones from Camp Chef at Cabela's as well. So, uh, although that is a deep fryer, not a uh, not a shallow fryer like this. So, yeah, this is really, really a great pan. Uh, Raymond, can somebody please tell me if eyelids are removed when cooking on an old wood stove, and do you cook on the lid with cast iron? Um, I have never used one of those stoves. I don't have any information on that. I don't see why you couldn't do it. I mean, it's cast iron. It's a flat cast iron surface. You could certainly cook on it if you wanted to. Um, I would think it would be kind of rough. Actually, I have seen, let me put this back. I have seen some so-called griddles, round griddles for uh, at flea markets and antique stores. They call them griddles, but I bet they are stove eyes. Uh, they're round, and the key, I think, is that they don't have a long handle that's not easy for you to lift, but they have this very short, wide, round, this type of a handle on the griddle, and I think that's actually a stove eye. I don't think that's an actual griddle. You can use it as a griddle, of course, which I guess answers your question there. Um... Met Renator. I use the BSR fish fryer uh, all the time. Actually, I inspired it. Well, thank you again. <laughs> I think the rims on the bottom of the cast iron are meant to fit down into the open eye of the stove. That's exactly what it's for, and that's really what size numbers come from in, ca in cast iron skillets. Uh, the size number eight or the size number 10, that's not a measurement, but rather it's meant a number eight skillet would fit in, into a number eight stove eye, um, that size. So, and they continue using those things long after stoves stopped having those kind of stove eyes. Now, Lodge kept using them, for instance, all the way up to around the 1990s or so, and they finally switched over to just plain measurements. And wow, have I really been doing this thing for an hour and 13 minutes? Boy, I didn't even think I there would be enough um, time to go over. I didn't think I'd have enough material. I haven't even talked about things like my, uh, you know, like my uh, nice uh, handled pepper grinder, for instance, or the difference between kosher salt, which uh, you definitely want to have in your kitchen in addition to regular kind of salt or other kinds of utensils. Yeah, let me show off this nerdy thing here that I really, really love. And this is <clears throat> a titanium spork. I mean, when this thing is pure geekness, I'll tell you about this. And this is uh, one of those, one of the few things 
I received as a gift when I was married <laughs> that I really, really fell in love with. This I've been I've had this for uh, more than 10 years now, and this thing still looks brand new. Um, I find that you can actually buy these things at sporting goods stores or places like REI, for instance, and it is totally geeky and it is wonderful to use and this thing makes a great gift too. Hint, hint, the holidays are coming. You want to make somebody chuckle and give them something that they'll really use? Get them a titanium spork. <laughs> Uh, my mom and grandmother cooked on wood stoves with their cast iron with eyes out and on. Always depends on the heat temperatures. Jason, we heat the stove, the store I work at, at with a wood stove. And we've, when we've cooked on it, we leave the lids on for medium heat or take them off for high heat. Stove eyes are why you have a heat ring. Absolutely. Yes. Um, am I getting old? As I'm getting older with arthritis, I find my cast iron is too heavy to cook with. What do you feel about lighter pans like Solid Technics wrought iron? Well, I would say that it should be uh, great for cooking because, yeah, it's iron. I'm not going to deny that. You know, it's not like, I mean, yeah, I've got this cast iron obsession and I love using cast iron for everything. Um, cast iron is not the be all and end all. And if you have a use for something lighter, like you said, you unfortunately it's heavy and you're having trouble lifting it, then Definitely try something like that. Um, the important thing, of course, is what works for you because you're the one cooking. It's your kitchen, and, and you should really do what works best for you. That's really what it comes down to. So, I mean, I love using cast iron. It's a lot of fun. Um, in about another 20 to 30 years or so, I probably will have to stop using it for that very same reason. I hope not, but it may happen eventually. Uh, I bought one of those titanium sporks from Gerber, but I don't use it enough. <laughs> I use this thing almost every day. Oh, one thing, actually, now that I pointed out. Um, get the regular gray one. Don't get the colored ones. The colored ones are, in fact, the gray ones, and they've got like a chrome uh, pl plating or polish or coloring on them or something. That will eventually scratch off. So just get the plain metal one. I mean, the colored ones, the blue and the pink, they look nice, but they will not last forever. This thing's going to last forever. <laughs> uh, just a tip. Be careful, uh, Jason. Be careful what fuel you put in a wood stove. 30 pounds of crushed pecan hulls will make the entire stove glow red and, make, and melt the aluminum tags off of it. Oh, yeah. And that's where we talk about things like warping cast iron. Cast iron is almost indestructible, but the key word there is almost. If you're not careful, you can indeed damage it. It's very hard to damage, though, from everyday use, and that's one great reason why it is such a great user in the kitchen here. And, what, and I guess one real reason why I love cast iron um, I love the history. I love the mystery of it. I mean, there are so many things to discover about it. I mean, it's, it's, we're cooking in pieces of American history here too. So, I mean, who is going to pass on their or green egg, yeah, copper, yeah, dollar store or job lot, nonstick pants. Who's going to pass those on to their grandkids? No one. On the other hand, we are going to pass on our cast iron to our family with pride and with love. So, and I really, I mean, I've been going almost an hour and 20 minutes here and I'm shocked and very happy that it's been, that it's gone on so long with so little effort. So I guess I'm going to have to call this one to be continued because it's yeah. Uh, traps. Oh, okay. Traps. <laughs> traps. Even though it's really not related to that, but yeah, I know somebody wanted to point this out, even though this has nothing to do with cooking in cast iron, it does have to do with cooking in the kitchen. What's this? This is a fruit fly trap. And she was very proud of putting this uh, together because no one is immune to fruit flies, unfortunately. Those freaking little uh, flooding and buzzing things that come show up in the kitchen, no matter what. You could have a fancy kitchen, you could have a cheap kitchen, and you'll probably still get fruit flies at some point or another. She took a, a little plastic container, filled it with vinegar. This is nothing more than vinegar, and poked little holes in the cover. What? 
apple cider vinegar and uh, poke little holes in the top and the fruit flies went crazy for it. We've killed a whole bunch of fruit flies with this thing. It cost pennies and it's uh, really great. So if you're having trouble with things like fruit flies, then yeah, okay, you want to do that. She asked me to uh, include that in the video, so it's, it's worth mentioning. But I mean, as I said, I'm going to have to say to be continued because this thing's gone on for an hour and 20 minutes and there's so much more we can talk about. So on the other hand, it's cast iron Wednesday and I'm really, there's no reason why I can't do one of these live discussions every Wednesday. So uh, how about that? Let's schedule, a, let's schedule another one of these for next Wednesday and we will continue from there and see what happens. I hope that's okay, folks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Techman71 and Jump Keys and Jason and Gary Boyd. Um, but thank you very much for showing up. I mean, that's the thing I really, really much appreciate. I mean, as I said, I've had a lot of fun doing this. And I am more than flattered that so many people have actually uh, shown up and subscribed to my channel. And people like what I'm doing for some reason, even though I'm just an amateur. And you know how a lot of people say they watch those cooking videos, those stupid viral videos, and they watch them and say, I got to try this. And, I, and they never do. I'm very flattered to hear from people who have actually uh, done some of the stuff I've done in my videos and more importantly, liked it. So that's really about, I'd say that's a good way to end this, if nothing else. Thank you very much for showing up, everybody. It's, this has been a lot of fun, as you can see. I mean, that's how I was able to carry on so easily, a lot more than I expected. Thank you very much, everyone. So I guess we could say we will see you next week on Cast Iron Wednesday. And we will uh, continue from there. Thank you again, everybody. Have yourself a good uh, good evening. Have fun cooking, everyone.